Welcome, everyone. Hi, uh, you are here with Clocking In with Clara Maza, Labor and Employment News for Government Contractors. I'm Sarah Nash. I'm a partner in Plero Maza's Labor and Employment Group, and I'm joined here by my partner, Nicole Atala, also a partner at Plero Maza. <laughs> hey, Nicole. Uh, so we are excited to talk to you today about today's topic, which is pricing for your government contractor contracts. So as you are putting in bids, evaluating what it's going to cost to perform certain work, there are some pretty important considerations. So Nicole, could you give us sort of a broad view of what some of those considerations might look like? Sure. And just to be clear, we are not talking about how to, you know, calculate your overhead or indirect rates or anything like that. We are specifically talking about why thinking about your labor is important to your pricing strategy and what you need to think about when you are factoring in your labor costs for a base plus four contract or a contract that will run a term of years, right? And one of the one of the biggest price impacts that often our contractors face is not materials or you know supplying the you know the technology that you might need it's that labor right like labor is a principal component of many of the um, contracts that our clients are out there bidding on and too often we hear from hr teams that oh we have a problem uh, with our labor rates and I feel like in order to be compliant with insert law A, B, C, D, or E, I feel like we need to classify people correctly or pay them right. And my executive team is telling me that we don't have the money built into the contract to do that. And that's really a, um, sometimes, many times, there's been an oversight in looking at pricing those contracts on the labor side uh, in advance when you go out to bid on those contracts. And the principal, the principal ways that contractors get upside down is either not understanding prevailing wage requirements, right? So not understanding the Service Contract Act or the Davis-Bacon Act, its applicability to a contract or how to classify, pay the right wages and benefits, right? So that's going to be a huge hit if you're bidding on one of those contracts and don't really understand it. And incidental to that is also just general wage classification under the Fair Labor Standards Act, right? Like not understanding when someone's exempt from overtime requirements or non-exempt from overtime requirements or misclassifying folks as independent contractors. Um, and the Department of Labor just issued a new independent contractor rule, which we're going to tackle in another one of these in the next few weeks. Um, but not understanding how to classify folks is going to be really, um, really, you know, instrumental in kind of running afoul of your pricing strategy. The other component that's critically important is understanding state law, particularly exemptions and salary base. So the, the contracts, most contracts not provide a way for you to equi equitably adjust your contract for uh, increases in the labor market rates, right? So it's really hard to hire a certain classification at what you anticipated being able to hire them at or increases to that salary basis test on the state or frankly, the federal level. And we're facing a salary basis test increase at the federal level if that proceeds through the Biden administration or not understanding state law increases, right? So you bid it understanding that you might have some non-exempt hourly employees and those employees are subject to state law in, you know, five different states. And I looked at the minimum wage and I thought it was fine, except a lot of these states are increasing their minimum wages. So you start getting into a year or two out much, much harder to recoup there. Isn't that something you can just send over to the government though? It, I mean, it wasn't your decision to increase these wages. It was a law that you had to comply with. No, the, gov the federal government, at least in government contracting, generally does not provide a right for that adjustment. Now, can you ask for it? Can you try to justify it? Yes, and from time to time, we've been successful in helping clients navigate that. 
but it's really up to the agency, right? It's, it's not something that they're required to do. Um, you are required, particularly if there's been some sort of notice, right? It's hard for us to go out and say, feel bad for us because wages went up in a state or there's a new requirement in the state. If when we bid on the contract, those out years had already been established, right? So many states will say, we're gonna increase our minimum wage to $17 an hour. We're gonna do that over three to five years. And you had notice of that when you did it. Mm -hmm. You might be more empathetic. Again, they don't have a legal obligation to do this, but there might be some more empathy if the law was passed during the pendency of the contract. Got it. What about with the FLSA changes that are coming down and raising that salary basis test? Is the change from exempt to non-exempt something that the government would consider a price adjustment for? No, because it's your obligation to classify people, right? So it really puts contractors in a rock and a hard place. Um, and, and it impacts like if the salary basis test goes up into the 60,000s, there's a big, that's a huge jump from 37 and change, right? Which is where the Biden administration would like to go with exemptions. So the option is either raise those folks up to the salary basis test that would be required um, or to convert them into hourly employees and pay them overtime, right? And often if those folks are working overtime, they haven't been tracking their time, they're not used to it, you have all of these issues, they might be subject to now state laws for meal and rest breaks that they weren't subject to before. Um, so it can cause all of these other issues along with wage compression issues, right? So you might be like, if I raise all of my leads up to, you know, assuming you have a lead that can qualify for an exemption, which is another question mark, but let's just say I raise those folks up to 68,000, my project managers are making $68,000 in Tennessee or something like that, you know, that's going to be a significant issue um, that you're going to have to deal with. Yikes, so it sounds like it's really important to have your HR involved in these decisions as you're evaluating how you're going to bid these contracts. Thanks, it's really helpful information. Well, I think that's it then. Thanks for joining us on this week's uh, you know, episode of Clocking In, and we'll be back soon.